So we're obviously very excited about all of this innovation and the rapid adoption of the lake house architecture. But we're not the only ones that are seeing this new pattern unfold. So I'd like to have a chat with Matt Garman, Senior Vice President at AWS. Matt, super excited to chat with you. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. So I got to start uh, with EC2, the legendary service that you know became the foundation of all of Amazon Web Services. And you know, uh, you're one of the masterminds behind it. Can you take us back to those days? You know, tell us some inside stories. You know, were there any doubts? Uh, you know, how did you guys come up with it? You know, how did it go down? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So as you mentioned. Uh, I actually joined AWS in 2006. Uh, it was right after we had launched S3 and just a couple of months before we launched EC2. Um, and uh, it was a fun time. And, you know, I think at the time, um, you know, I don't think any of us had any idea how fast or how quickly the business would grow. Um, but, you know, we always knew it had a lot of potential and, and we knew that folks uh, were super interested in the idea of these on-demand services. Um, and we thought they'd be compelling to a wide range of people. And, you know, I remember early on, um, like I think almost every conversation that I had started out with, why would I buy compute and storage services from a bookseller, an online bookseller? Um, and we'd have to walk them through how Amazon had built up this capability and, and, and why, why it made sense to buy them from us. And, you know, eventually people got over that. And I, you know, I, I remember one, one story in particular, uh, I was sitting down with, with all the tech leadership actually at one of the, the biggest banks in Wall Street um, at their offices in Manhattan. And they were super interested in this new idea of com cloud computing and what it was. And so we went through and explained how it all worked. And at the end of the meeting, they basically told us there's no chance that any big bank would ever put a production workload and run it outside of their own facility. Now, you know, of course, you know, fast forward 15 years later and Goldman Sachs and JPMC and Barclays and Capital One, you know, they're all running these large production workloads in AWS. But um, at the time, you know, and it took us a long time to get there at a the time and we, they, they, they didn't see it. And, uh, and we had to work with them. We had to help them reinvent themselves. We had to invent a lot of cool stuff along the way that made that possible. Um, and part of that was, was inventing kind of this broad set of services that we have in AWS today. And that's why those banks and, and others in all in sorts of industries are now running on AWS is because we have this broad set of compute offerings. That's, that's really the broadest out there, including things like custom CPUs and custom uh, machine learning accelerators uh, like Graviton2 and Inferentia that we make that that give customers like a 40% price performance benefit over anything else they can do. Um, we have things like 400 gigabit networking um, that help their big data workloads run better. And those type of innovations, um, they really kind of change that price performance gap and that really capabilities gap um, for some of the biggest customers in the world, as well as some of the, the earliest startups. Um, and for every type of workload in the world, whether they're just pure compute, data analytics and, and machine learning. And um, it's one of the reasons why the vast majority of machine learning is done in AWS and the cloud today. And it's a big part of why we have thousands of joint customers together. We're uh, super excited about Graviton2 and all the interesting um, innovations that are coming up. What was actually the thing that made some of these banks eventually come around? Yeah, there's a couple things. I think one of them was that, that price performance benefit where they saw that they could actually get both the price performance benefits as well as the scale um, and it, you know, it, it turns out they, they value agility. And, you know, I think um, uh, David Solomon uh, said during one of our conferences, the, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, that, you know, they actually have more software developers at Goldman Sachs than they have bankers. And so just like uh, a lot of developers um, out there in other industries, their developers wanted that agility. They wanted to be able to move quickly, iterate quickly, take advantage of new services and capabilities. And as we started bringing out this breadth of services, they started to realize that there was a lot of benefits there and they could focus on, you know, how do they build better risk models and how do they build better um, trading platforms and, and other financial instruments and less about how do they manage data centers. And, and um, you know, and we had to go through all of the compliance pieces and other things like that that helped get them there. But, um, but now they're, they're happy customers and they're growing rapidly. I'm curious, you know, any, any favorite joint customers you have, like, you know, that are leveraging Databricks that's then, you know, in turn are leveraging all of the infrastructure that you guys have and all the other services? Uh, there's a ton of them. Um, uh, yeah, I, I can, I can handle, a, I can uh, name a couple and it's, uh, it's been fun. I think one thing I'd, I'd call out is it's, it's been fun working together with you and the team over the last, uh, since 2012, I think you said, so the last nine or 10 years, it's been great to see your company grow. And that partnership has been great for us. I think, um, you know, if we look at our joint customers, uh, one I'd call out is um, John Deere, uh, the 
and and one of the things they're they're a, a super mature and industry leading analytics company, and they really think deeply about how they're how they can use data to better further their company. And uh, so one of the things in particular is they had a, a self managed Hadoop cluster that they were running, uh, and they decided to migrate that onto Databricks on AWS. And you know one of the the cool things about them is first they were super dedicated and thinking about how do they do that in a secure way, in a highly available way, and how they could add value to the business. And since they've migrated onto to Databricks and AWS, um, they've done some really cool things. I think one is um, they really wanted to get better cross-departmental analytics. So they had a bunch of data silos all throughout their company and there's a bunch of different places. And they, wanted, they thought that there was an opportunity to get better insight if they could put that all in one place. And so they did that. They put it all together and now they're starting to see how they can play with price elasticity for their products to better uh, manage their business. They're looking at opportunities to um, optimize their inventory and they're looking for insights and ways that they can improve the customer experience. Uh, another cool thing they've actually built is uh, this thing they call agricultural analytics products. And what they do is they actually incorporate information from satellite telemetry, from data about the soil and the weather and, and you know, how many acres you have and all of these other pieces including even like maintenance information about your particular tractor or equipment. And they put all of that information together and give customers some interesting insights into how they're using their products so that they can actually get better utilization out of their John Deere products. Um, so that, that's one really cool example. Um, another one I'd call out, you know, kind of completely different industry is Comcast. Also had a really large on-prem Hadoop cluster that they, that they migrated to uh, Databricks on AWS. Yeah, that's fascinating. I'm I'm super excited uh, about John Deere because it's a company that you wouldn't uh, necessarily expect that they would be so much in the forefront uh, of data and AI. Uh, and similarly, also excited about Comcast. So data and AI, like now, you know, we're moving higher up in the stack. I mean, you started with EC2. Uh, you guys offer a lot of different services now. Uh, I think AI and data is a big focus for AWS. Mm -hmm. You also embrace this paradigm, uh, the lake house. Uh, and talked a lot about it. Can you tell us a little bit about what you see in that space around data and AI, the lake house, and what customers are doing? Yeah, to, to me, it's a fascinating space. I think it's, it's super interesting to see everything that's happening right now. And particularly when you think about the intersection of data and different data stores that are out there and then analytics and machine learning is as you call out, you know, it's, it's super interesting. And, and if you think about data stores, right? You know, historically, you just put everything into a relational database and you would call it a day but data stores are being completely reinvented around the world. And particularly as customers think about the explosion of data, right? They used to deal in just gigabytes and now it's terabytes, petabytes, exabytes. I have a customers that are even talking to us about yottabytes of data, which I had to go look up and see how big it is. It's hard to even think about that much data. But you know, if you think there's, there's predictions out there that in the next three years, there'll be more data created than in the last 30 years combined. And so that there's an incredible amount of growth and it's, it's only accelerating. And so, you know, we're, the, the world is reinventing these data stores because historical data stores just don't work anymore. You can't just stick everything in a relational database. And so we have to continue to reinvent how everyone can manage this level of data. And it turns out that that scale of data management can really only be done in the cloud. You can't really scale your on-prem data centers to handle something like that. And in AWS, customers are able to take advantage of virtually unlimited storage and a huge range of analytics and machine learning capabilities that help them unlock value from that data. And so we're actually seeing hundreds of thousands of customers today use AWS and really leverage partner solutions like Databricks to really figure out how they get value from that data. And so, as you mentioned, kind of we see these customers that are embarking on these data strategies and they're starting to build these data lakes as one central place where they can have all of their different disparate data sources. They wanna have a place where it's easier to have this discovery, governance, the right level of access. And it turns out that the majority of customers around the world actually start and leverage S3 as the core of their data lake. Now, these customers want to be able to have a couple of things when they think about their data strategy. They want to be able to make decisions quickly, and they have multiple organizations that need to be able to store large amounts of data in a variety of open formats, and they want to break down these disconnected data silos. Right, That's a, it's a killer for a lot of enterprises where they just have data locked up in different places. And then they want to empower their teams to easily run analytics and machine learning with whatever their preferred tool is or whatever preferred technique is, and they wanna have the right security and management things so that they can control who has access to which data and who's allowed to see which data and have the right governance on top of their data. 
Is it fair to say, I think Werner Vogels talked about your internal, how you guys at Amazon internally actually organize all your own data. Uh, I think he referred to it as a giant lake. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a lake house paradigm? Yeah, it's, that's, that's exactly, and that's how we, we talk about the lake house paradigm where we have a bunch of these analytic services kind of around with S3 in the middle. Um, and so we add capabilities to S3 to make it easier to use uh, this scalable data lake, but really it's these purpose-built data uh, uh, and analytics platforms that allow you to kind of get that interesting insight into that data um, with various different types of, of performance and, uh, and cost capabilities. The theme this year about the conference is that the future is open. And we just announced uh, open technology around sharing of data sets in a secure fashion. So it's open source Delta Lake will contain Delta sharing. And uh, we uh, have one of the premier partners of that being uh, AWS Data Exchange. Uh, supporting that protocol. Uh, how important is data sharing securely between organizations and different PUs? And what's the significance of data sharing in AWS Data Exchange? Yeah, no, we, we love that. I think it's a super exciting announcement you have. So congratulations to you and the team. Um, you know, we built the AWS Data Exchange uh, because our customers were telling us that they wanted a better way to easily license and share data, both in proprietary formats and open formats with each other. And they were using these kind of antiquated methods of, of FTPing files around and, and literally shipping hard drives back and forth to each other. And it was just too much work. And so today, as an example, many of our customers have this situation where because of COVID, they have a bunch of uncertainty in their business. And many of our customers are actually using a variety of third-party data sources um, via the AWS data exchange around things like location, aggregated data movement, consumer spending patterns, and things like that. And they'll leverage them from, from vendors like Foursquare or Factius and to better understand um, and make decisions on when and where to reopen various businesses or how they forecast demand in, in various un, uh, uncertain times. And so I, I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity for the sharing of data, both in open data sets um, and as well as open formats, as well as proprietary data sets that can be layered on top of those. And I think our goal is to make it easier for customers to share data in whichever way they want, whether it's licensed or, or just open. Um, and we love to see that. We're excited to hear more about how our mutual customers can use data exchange um, and Delta sharing together. And, uh, and so we're excited to see where it goes and, uh, and congrats on the launch. That's exciting. Very, very excited to partner with you, Matt. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me and uh, great talking.